Ladies, gentlemen, and self-aware software development platforms, welcome to the August edition of Read Write Mix. Really pleased to have you all here. A big thank you to Say Media for providing Say Space to us so we can have this event here. Woohoo! Woo -hoo. And we're going to dive right into it because I know you're eager to hear from our guests this evening. Mr. Mike McHugh, the CEO of Flipboard. Hey, Mike. Thanks, guys. Right on. So, welcome to the mix. Thank you. This is awesome to be here, man. We I'm are. Uh, we're talking media. It's it's very meta because I do media, you do media. We're creating more media about media. Uh, I understand someone is creating a Flipboard magazine about this talk right now. I love that. That's great. So first of all, you know, I know you've got 100 million users now, mm -hmm. right? Acti mm -hmm. 100 million activated accounts. Mm -hmm. Lots of people using Flipboard. Mm -hmm. Lots of people who may not have heard of Flipboard. Um, yeah. It's a, a personal magazine. What does that mean in, in this day and age? Yeah. Um, well, by the way, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And, uh, and I'm very psyched about the um, charity here for uh, Girls Who Code. Yes, Especially because I have two daughters, who one of whom is at Minecraft camp uh, this week and learning how to code via Minecraft, which is pretty awesome. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yes, yeah. all, of your, um, all of your ticket reservation fees are going to Girls Who Code. Um, we've raised thousands of dollars. This is, tonight's event is going to add more to that and help girls uh, like Mike's daughters go to the ex summer program. Ex exactly. Any uh, female developers in the audience? One. All right. <laughs> Two, maybe? OK. And then uh, entrepreneurs? Any entrepreneurs here? Mix? OK, great. Nice. Um, no, this is great. I, thank you again for having me. And yes, to answer your question, um, Flipboard is a personal magazine. Um, and uh, yeah, I like that phrase because it allows us to have a lot of artistic license in what that should be. Um, you know, but the basic idea, and it's actually not an idea that um, we came up with it. It's been around for a while. Nicholas Negroponte wrote, wrote about it in an, an awesome book called Being Digital, uh, which is this notion that, you know, um, we all love magazines um, and newspapers, uh, but, um, you know, they're the same for everyone. And um, wouldn't it be awesome if you could have a magazine that, you know, imagine we had, you know, incredible journalists and, you know, photographers and editors all working to you, for you, to build an amazing, um, magazine just for you every minute of every day and had it look just as cool as uh, Time Magazine or National Geographic. Um, and uh, that's a, a really cool vision. A lot of people have talked about this over the years. And uh, with the web, people thought, well, maybe it would happen with the web. It didn't really quite happen. And, um, but I think because of social, in particular, the curation part of social, uh, and because of uh, things like mobile uh, touchscreen devices in particular, um, this is actually a vision that can happen now, and there are profound implications with it. And uh, you know, the idea of having a magazine made for every person and updated with the things that they care about the most uh, every minute of every day, from content from the world's best publishers, um, content from the leading social networks, uh, all in one place is is a really cool thing. Um, and so that that's what we're building. It's a personal magazine filled with everything you love. Um, uh, and, uh, and of course, you can read it, but you can also curate content uh, from that personal magazine uh, and uh, you know, share that curation with others. Uh, and we just embarked on that last year. So there's a lot going on, and, uh, but, but this, is, you know, this is our vision. And you really started with the social piece, right? That was, I, I remember there were two kind of core elements of, of Flipboard when it was first kind of presented to the world. One was design. It, was, it launched on the iPad. It was right. kind of built for this brand new device that we didn't, you know, didn't even really understand like what, what this was going to become. Right. And, um, and it was also leaning heavily on, on social. And, you know, Facebook and Twitter, if you think about it in 2010, yeah. weren't public companies. Right. Um, you know, maybe an order of magnitude fewer users definitely yeah, on Twitter. Definitely. Um, and, you know, kind of, it was kind of a gutsy bet to, to bet on those and there was no iPad. Things. Yeah. So you, you built this thing for the iPad without an iPad. How did that right. go? Well, you know, it is, uh, it, um, 
you know, this taking a step back, the, the reason why I'm excited about being an entrepreneur uh, these days uh, and building Flipboard is I really uh, believe in the power of great content to influence how people think, um, how the world works, um, how political leaders make decisions, how parents parent, uh, how professionals, you know, operate. I mean, I think everybody here can probably remember at least one article that you read over the years that shaped and influenced some important part of your life. Uh, and that article was created by a journalist, somebody who, you know, went to school, worked really hard, researched, and, you know, created that piece of content. And, um, and, and in the world of um, media, uh, which is about a $600 billion a year industry um, worldwide, uh, uh, that world has, has, you know, worked pretty well for us, whether it's magazines or newspapers. Now, the thing is, is that um, as we move to digital, that world is under massive disruption. Um, and what I mean by digital, of course, it's the web, but it's also social, it's mobile. And, um, and so there is both a threat and an opportunity here to, you know, really, you know, help, you know, great digital content, the kind of digital content that causes people to, you know, think and operate differently, uh, to really thrive. And so that was, that's the reason why we wanted to start um, this company. And the thing that I was profoundly influenced by was the notion of a magazine. Um, I love magazines. The, the founder of the New York, uh, New York Magazine, um, uh, uh, not New Yorker, but New York Magazine, um, calls magazines uh, uh, tribal organizing documents. You know, they are uh, enthusiasts who There's really care Pete about Felker, something. Right? Yes, yeah. and he's, you know, people who really care about something, whether it's cigars or photography or you know, dogs uh, or whatever, you can find a magazine for something that you really care about. There is a Ramona magazine on Flipboard. There, right? Oh yeah, excellent, yeah, exactly. I, I'm not proud. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that craftsmanship of creating a narrative and creating sort of cultivating and curating a, a, a community and, you know, and content around that thing that people are really enthusiastic about is a very powerful idea. And magazines have done that for years and years. But as we move, to digital, you know, content has become atomized mm -hmm. um, and you know put into reverse chronological feeds, and and I, we've lost some of that sense of narrative and some of that sense of you know sort of, you know groups of people who really care about something sharing really high quality content with each other, uh, and we also need to figure out a way to have that great content be subsidized and, mm -hmm. and monetized so that that content can continue to, to be created. So anyway, those were the basic things that kind of got us interested in building something like Flipboard. And, you know, as we started to think more and more about, you know, what could a personal magazine be, you know, obviously social was going to be a fundamental part of that. You know, I think um, that the web has moved to a curated web, a social web, and yet we still use the browser that we built in the mid-90s to browse that web. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that mobile touchscreen devices, starting with the phone, but ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, the tablet, um, are profoundly uh, important for how you present that content. Um, and so we, we thought about all those things. That, uh, and ultimately, when the rumors for the iPad started to um, happen, we realized, you know, wow, we should, you know, rather than doing this, we were initially going to do it as a website. Mm -hmm. um, but when we heard about the rumors for this tablet from Apple, um, we thought, you know, we should just build Flipboard for that. And uh, let's wait and see how that comes out. Let's design it for a large iPhone mm -hmm. and you know and we were right about that luckily and uh, and so you know that was how we got started so then everyone else came up uh, came out with a flipboard killer right <laughs> right you you went through you went through I think at least a couple of years of you know of uh, reading reading these headlines um, you're shockingly alive so yes yes how did that uh, um, what happened? I mean, AOL came after you, right? Mm -hmm. There's, I recently read this really interesting postmortem about AOL editions, which yeah. is no longer in the app store. Right. Um, Yahoo had one. AOL is a great partner of ours right now, actually. Yeah. Um, it's, people, it, it, people seem to, to come to your door when they, when they figure out this is hard. CNN bought Zeit. Right. And Mark Sear, you know, actually. That's, um, yeah. And the uh, former yeah. CEO of Zeit is here in the audience, Mark yeah. Johnson. Um, and 
so CNN bought Zeit, and and a lot of people were saying, oh, it's game over mm -hmm. for for Flipboard. Time mm -hmm. Warner has a, a newsreader, um, and yet, as it turned out, you ended up buying Zeit from CNN, and CNN is now creating magazines on Flipboard. Yeah. You know, I think as an entrepreneur, one of the things I've learned over the years is that you uh, should not really think too much about the competition. You should be aware of them, but um, you know, ultimately, if you're doing something that's valuable, you're going to have lots of competition yeah. from big players and small players. And Flipboard has you know a huge number of competitors, everything from Google, Facebook, Yahoo, to um, you know small startups. Um, and and so while we're aware of that, I tell my team and remind them that look, the amount of time we spend thinking about you know if you're thinking about a competitor, stop and take that time and think about our readers and our partners. And if we do that well, and we have a sense of first principles around what we're trying to do and why, mm -hmm. and a, 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 a long-term view on things, we're going to have some ups and downs. Uh, and some of those downs could be really painful. Some of those downs might even be caused by some competitor. But in the long run, this is a huge market, $600 billion. Mm -hmm. Only 20% of that advertising revenue has moved online. We're literally in early innings right now in the digital media realm. Right? Google, Facebook, Twitter are doing pretty well monetizing direct response ads. Uh, they're slicing up about 18% of the overall global mm -hmm. online advertising market. There's still a huge number of advertising uh, uh, ads and brand ads in particular that have yet to move online. So if you have a long view and you, you have good first principles about what you're trying to do for your, for your audience and your, your partners, then in the end, as long as you stay focused on that, um, you know you'll 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 end up creating something great, and that's how we that's how we think. So, a lot of these Flipboard killers copied kind of Flipboard circa 2010. They, <laughs> right. They, they copied right. the social. They copied the kind of feed reader, you know, like Google Reader, but uh, you know, but mobile element. Um, they copied like the you know the relationships with big established publishers. Um, but a year and a half ago, you did something that was really hard to copy. You unleashed these tools for creating magazines yeah. on your million, on millions of users. Yeah. Um, and well, I think it's. I think you uh, you told me recently it's it's about maybe seven percent, single digit percentage of your users actually take the initiative to create a magazine. But that still resulted in. 10 million magazines, it's right. a lot of yeah. kind of collections of content. Right. Um, and that's happened in under a year and a half. Yeah. So you now have this kind of moat like YouTube or, you know, or Pinterest in, in yeah. these, you know, in We're getting these, there, user, yeah. in these user collections. Yeah. Um, what do those magazines actually look like? Are they, you know, are they like my Ramona the Love Terrier magazine, just kind of something you know, yeah. I, something I don't really expect anyone to read, just something I do for fun? Or yeah, there are so many different um, magazines out there, and I love how deep they go. We, we have found um, there's generally about five different kinds of magazines that people create on Flipboard. There are the collections. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, you know, there's a magazine for kale smoothies. Mm -hmm. All is about kale smoothie recipes, and it turns out there's a lot of ways to make kale smoothies. And so there's a magazine, in fact, there are many magazines about kale smoothies, if you search for that on Flipboard. It's crazy. Um, and so people do these collections for their own personal, you know, collect, it's like they're collecting, you know, recipes for a paleo diet, or they're collecting, you know, um, places that they want to visit, um, books that they might want to read. Um, so, so that's one category. The other one is um, tribal, mm -hmm. right? So, um, for example, uh, there's a group of people, there's this unknown cult, maybe some of you actually belong to this cult, of people who like to go and visit modern ruins. You know? So, for example, all those cool ships that are out there docked in the bay, those old ships from mm -hmm. like the Cold War era, people like to sneak on those ships and like take all sorts of cool pictures and of, of these modern ruins. And there's a magazine called Modern Ruins Magazine that's really popular on Flipboard. That's just filled with great, amazing pictures of Which these you, modern ruins. I mean, you never see on a on a on a print newsstand. I mean, who would right. know that? And that's too that niche now. Yeah. You know, but that's the beauty of magazines, right? Is that is that you know, 
Um, I mean, if the economic model were more sustainable right now, you'd have a modern ruins magazine. Yeah. But you know, it's just hard for that to exist. You got to pay for the printing and the cost of you know, all, all of the distribution. But the, the the other kind of magazine that we have is news related magazines, right? So. Um, uh, you know, uh, what's going on in the Ukraine right now mm -hmm. or Syria um, or, or more sort of topical news like um, what's going on with uh, immigration mm -hmm. or marriage equality or, uh, you know, uh, those kinds of issues. We have other magazines that are uh, event oriented, right? So uh, when Steve Jobs died, when Robin Williams died, um, people created tribute magazines, all the best mm -hmm. stuff, the best content, best pictures about, you know, from about Robin Williams, you know, or, all the YouTube videos of Steve Jobs' speeches. Um, and, and then we have uh, magazines that are more utilitarian. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, they're like portfolios, you know, mm -hmm. real estate homes that you represent. Uh, you're a teacher and, you know, the classwork that you want to have your students uh, read, you know, the, the you know, articles you want your students to read about. Um, or uh, or my, we have a great company called Aquascapes and they, 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 they on Flipboard and they, they have this awesome magazine just of like backyard ponds and uh, landscaping work that they've done. And it's just, it's, it's, it's so cool. And they're, they're so enthusiastic about this ability to sort of pull together this great content, get it out to an audience. And mm -hmm. um, so we have these different kinds of magazines that users have created. And, um, and it, it, it's, it's, just, it's just accelerating. But do, do they find audiences? Yeah, I mean, uh, what you find are, um, uh, audiences that they are going and getting, right? So they'll tweet out a link to their magazine. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so they will find, you know, readers that way. One of the things that we need to do is figure out a way to have those 10 million magazines be more discoverable on mm -hmm. Flipboard, which is one of the reasons why we acquired Zeit. Mm -hmm. um, the Zeit team, Mark and his team, did an amazing job building a personalized discovery engine based on topics and interests and building an interest graph. And, um, and so we thought that was incredibly important uh, to help provide discovery for all this great curation mm -hmm. so that these magazines can find an audience. But if I recall the statistics, you have, you have magazines with 500,000 subscribers, 700,000 yeah. on, on that scale. Yes. And some of these are actually created by your users. Some of them are publishers. Some of them are publishers. You also have, um, I, I don't think we've talked about this yet, you have some editors on staff. That's right. That's right. And they're actually... You're paying them to create um, typically news news magazines, right? Right. Um, what we've been doing is, um, you know, we actually started with Flipboard as we thought about how do we populate this personal magazine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one approach was just purely algorithmic. You know, just go get content and you know sort it by keyword and try to. But we realized that you know there needed to be a human touch here. There needed to be people who were thoughtful about who were the best sources. What was the best content, and they could pull it together in a in a um, uh, curated way, and maybe they rely on algorithms to help find that content. But ultimately, the human touch turns out to be really important. What we learned from doing that was that our publishers wanted to do that, our mm -hmm. advertisers wanted to do that, and our users wanted to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing with Flipboard, and you'll see as a theme from us over the course of the next uh, several months, is curation, mm -hmm. enabling both you know, people to curate and algorithms to curate and to the wonderful interchange of algorithms and people working together to almost create bionic curators. So, you know, I think that there's an amazing, amazing opportunity for, for people to package up content for whatever theme, for whatever tribe, for whatever event, you know, whatever collection that they think matters. And, um, and so, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's a really core thing for us. So now, how, are, how is Flipboard making money, and what's in it for the publishers? I know, um, I, know I see ads on Flipboard. Um, you've announced like, partnerships with big publishing brands yes. to kind of do, yeah. do revenue sharing. Yeah. Um, so what, happen, what happens to everyone else, like yeah. you know, these 10 million magazines? Right. Are they out in the cold? Another key thing for me as an mm -hmm. entrepreneur um, is the only kind of business that I want to build is one where other people win as a result of being involved in that business, whether it's the team or it's the partners or the advertisers or the users, of course. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
from the very earliest days of uh, before we even knew what the product was going to be called, before we even knew that it was going to be Flipboard or that it was going to be on an iPad or a tablet, we started thinking about the power of advertising full page beautiful brand ads in these magazines. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, you would never want to buy Vogue without the ads. You definitely, if you have a magazine, if you're really into rock climbing, mm -hmm. you want the advertising in that magazine. If you're into snowboarding, you know, the ads in Snowboarding Magazine are just as cool as the content. But if you go to one of those websites, man, if you could turn off those banner ads, you would, right? People hate banner ads. And so, um, so advertising is, is uh, done right, is, is really, you know, compelling and, and, and valuable. The problem on the web is that, um, you know, if you take a look at a website, um, uh, it, it's just surround, the content is surrounded by all sorts of stuff that just causes the content to be, you know, this tiny little, you know, segment. Yeah. Now that's, that's changing a little bit. We, we have these buttons now that are just like, show me the text. Yeah, exactly. You know, just just show me the text, of, get rid of all this stuff. Yeah. And, and I think that um, what we wanted to do was kind of take a page from the magazine mm -hmm. world and say, all right, so let's have a full page allocated to the content and a full page for the advertising and create a flow through that content that feels very much like a print magazine. Mm -hmm. So ironically, actually, I think the future for monetization lies in some of the past mm -hmm. um, in what was done in magazines. But it goes beyond that. Um, so there's also you know, content marketing and you know, brands that are creating content. And um, increasingly, you know, brands that have genuine voice uh, mm -hmm. and are creating really compelling content have an opportunity to get that content out as, as a sort of a form of advertising at mm -hmm. some level. And who's, so, uh, who's doing that today? Well, a good example would be um, Mini Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they have all sorts of really cool videos and stuff about being original and um, you know, sort of finding who you are. And uh, you know, it's kind of part of their brand. And uh, it's just fun, really cool stuff. Another great example would be, um, uh, um, let's say, uh, Merrill Lynch, who ha has actually done a lot of in-depth reporting on what's happening uh, with the Euro. Mm -hmm. Or what's going on? What are the implications of the, you know, Ukraine crisis on you know the European economy? Or how should you be thinking about planning for you know your retirement or things like that? There's actually really in-depth content that they've invested, and they have mm -hmm. editors and journalists so working in, on that. Instead of the classic, you know, like aging couple holding each other, looking concerned, right? You yeah. know, print ad. Exactly. This is, this is actually like these are mag kind of magazines within magazines. Yeah, exactly. So so um, you know. Um, uh, there's there's an opportunity for an advertiser to buy a full page beautiful ad. Mm -hmm. um, let's say Delta, for example, bought a beautiful ad on Flipboard with a great picture of their um, new first class red eye seat, and they're advertising the red eye. But um, they had a link to a magazine that they curated mm -hmm. um, called The Science of Sleep, and mm -hmm. they just found some great content about sleep and mm -hmm. you know how to think about sleep when mm -hmm. you're traveling and so on. And people were super interested in that, and so people read that. Cisco has one called the Futurist Feed, which is just all sorts of great things about, great content about the internet of everything, right? And, uh, and this is content that sometimes they create, but other times they're just curating and pointing at uh, other content that other publishers are creating. So it's, um, it's really powerful. I, you know, I think that um, the opportunity to have uh, curation work for brands and for mm -hmm. publishers just as much as it works for users is, is very key part of what Flipboard's all about. By the way, I, I, uh, I've given my reporter who's covering this talk tonight a very tough assignment because I've banned the word curation and <laughs> platform. You did? Yes. <laughs> it's, wow. Uh, That's going to be a challenge. I, you know, I, I just like to, to find other ways to describe it, selecting, yeah. you know, selecting stories, arranging them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Editing. I like, maybe it's well, because I'm know, an editor. I like, I like the term editor. Packaging, narrative, yeah. um, collecting. Collecting you know. is... Collecting is really great because yeah. you know I think I think a lot of you know what Pinterest has shown is that a lot of people think of themselves as collectors. Yeah, um, and they're proud of their collections. But um, may, you know may, maybe I'm being a little stodgy and old-fashioned here because uh, it, it's clear that cur curation is kind of a, is a concept that has escaped into the wild to right. kind of talk about what we do when we right. pluck things out of the web and right. and weave them together. Yeah. Um, you, and, and the fact that there are 10 million magazines says that, 
that a lot of people are doing this. Absolutely, and I think it's going to accelerate. Um, we, um, you know, one of the things that um, uh, you mentioned was the the large publishers and mm -hmm. how are they doing on Flipboard. So you know, to just to sort of put a, a sort of finer point on that, we enable large publishers to um, uh, have their content look and feel great on these mobile devices, have that content find its audience, and then subsidize that content with full page ads full page ads that are sometimes attached to these mm -hmm. magazines that the brands are curating. And that's gone really well. And we rev share with the publishers. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how our business models work. Now we and start- full disclosure, ReadWrite is a partner of Flipboard. And which I'm very proud of. Exactly. And, um, uh, and, and ReadWrite also is doing some great curation on Flipboard with the ReadWrite, uh, the, the weekly magazine that mm -hmm. rounds up you know, what's going on, uh, coverage over the week, which is a really nice thing to have. Um, uh, and so, uh, so we've been working with the large publishers. And what you're going to start to see us do is start to now work with smaller and smaller publishers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we just started in April. Uh, we launched a program that enables um, smaller publishers to be able to have these full page, really awesome brand advertisements in their content as mm -hmm. well. So for example, My Modern Met. How many of you guys know My Modern Met as a blog? It's, it's a Got fantastic a blog. People with excellent taste. Right. There. And so um, that's a great blog. We love featuring their content. And uh, they've started to build up an audience on Flipboard. And so we wanted to enable them to have an ad. Uh, they're not huge blog, but they're really high quality. Um, we wanted to have them have an ad from Gucci or Breitling running in their content. And, uh, and so in April, we enabled that to happen. And so for a range of smaller publishers, um, in the first quarter of, of this uh, uh, program, we were able to generate uh, over a million dollars uh, for them uh, in advertising revenue that was just, you know, brand new revenue for them and high quality advertising, is you that, know, uh, Gucci and so on. Is that your, your gross revenue that you're then splitting with them? Or yes. Is that so, well, we, well, we wrote them a check for a million dollars. Wow. Over a million dollars, yeah, in the first quarter of the program. And that's just going to continue to accelerate as we add more publishers into that program and we continue to grow and, and, and so on. So, and this is, you've been doing this since April. Yeah. But you've never talked about it. We've never talked about it. This is the first time uh, we're making it public. Does it have a name? How do, how do publishers sign up? Um, it's still uh, early enough where I don't even have like a, an official name for it, but um, uh, publishers can come talk to us and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and can start to sign up for this. Um, it is something that, you know, is still an early program, so we only have a limited amount of ability to, to handle because we're really trying to be very careful about the ads and how the ads, you know, work inside the content. The content has to be paginated and it needs to be, mm -hmm. you know, optimized to handle these kinds of ads. But our our vision is that ultimately anybody can just come to a website, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, hit a few buttons and boom, now their content is on Flipboard and it's being monetized and they're getting a check. So ultimately, and whether that's an individual blogger or that's a, you know, a, um, a full-on publisher like the New York Times, um, anyone in between, you know, that's really what we're trying to, to create, that really great you know, ecosystem for, uh, for great content to thrive. And is this, um, is this a program sort of like YouTube's um, creators program where it's like a 55-45 split? Is it a set... Is it a set percentage, um, or yeah, we have matter? a we have a, a set percentage, um, and we we enable um, uh, you know we do we do the selling so mm -hmm. that the um, publishers don't have to. Although of course they can also sell too, mm -hmm. and um, they can bring advertisers into the mix as well, and then they get a higher percentage. So um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a program that I think is going to you know has gone well and is going to really help us um, create that um, ability to subsidize great content. So this is, um, I mean, this is analogous, not to, you know, not to maybe blow it out of proportion, but back in, back in the early part of the previous decade when Google came out with AdSense, yeah. um, people didn't really realize it, but that enabled a whole bunch of blogs to yeah. kind of, you know, find yeah. their first business legs and, right. you know, and grow up and, and become real businesses. Right. I think, you know, ReadWrite, then ReadWrite right. Web was, was among that set. Absolutely. I mean, one of my proudest moments as an entrepreneur is, you know, um, getting that million dollar check written to those publishers. Mm -hmm. That's a, that is an awesome thing. You know, we worked really hard over many years to, to make that happen. And I think that 
if we continue that, um, you know, it's going to hopefully enable entirely new kinds of magazines and publishers to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, the publishing world that we look at today is still very much rooted in the old world mm -hmm. of, you know, packaged content that comes out daily or weekly or monthly. And, and you know, through really large publishers. But the, in the, in the, where we are moving to is a, um, a, a, a much better, stronger meritocracy of great content. Mm -hmm. We started to see that with blogging. And I think we're going to see that even more. And by the way, you don't necessarily have to be only a blogger. Mm -hmm. You can just be a curator, somebody who's an expert at knowing who has the best content for surfing. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, and you should be able to make money on that too, ultimately. Mm -hmm. So my modern Met is they're they're writing their own articles, they're publishing them on their website, and they're distributing them on Flipboard. Right, and that's where they're making money is right. when those articles are read on Flipboard. That's right. That's um, right. But someone could simply put a collection of articles together. Right, assuming that the publishers were, you know, mm -hmm. getting their share of the economics, then yes, I think you could yeah. also. Um, on top of that, you know, enable some of the curators to be able to, to generate some revenue as well. That's a little further out into the future. You know, yeah. our first focus is on the people who are actually creating the content. Right. Um, and bringing and it to Flipboard. And exactly. Distributing it exactly. Way. But in the long run, you know, it's, it's, again, it's about the whole ecosystem that we have to be thinking about. So your, your business has changed so much in, in four years. You were, um, you were iPad only at first. Right. Um, Going, going to the iPhone was a big moment. Yeah, it took us a year and a half or two years to finally get to the iPhone. And, and your numbers were mm -hmm. really pretty small. Yeah. I, mean, I know it was, yeah. it was kind of a struggle mm -hmm. even to, you know, once you got past the first blush of like being associated with the, the iPad and this new device, mm -hmm. um, you know, the reality of the usage just, you know, yeah. kind of wasn't there. Then it turns out that people like really like to read stuff on their phones too. Yeah. Um, Android followed. Android after. followed that another year or so after. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're on many more devices, different screens. Right. Um, is social still a big deal for you? Well, social in the broadest sense of the word, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, the way the thing, the part about social that's really important for us is the uh, curating part, mm -hmm. the collecting part. Yeah. The, the, this this part of the web that is, you know. People, it used to be just the web was a, a web page pointing to another web page. Mm -hmm. That very simple concept built more than a trillion dollars in value, right? This, you click on a link, it loads, the browser loads a page from some other server around the world. That was an amazing breakthrough. Very simple concept. And the web, as we termed it back then, was you know, these pages pointing to other pages. Now we have a very different web, far more sophisticated web, which is people pointing to these pages people pointing to other people mm -hmm. who are pointing to these pages. This is a profound increase in both the power and complexity of the web. Mm -hmm. And yet we still use a web browser that was effectively designed and built in the mid-90s to browse that far more powerful web. And we're missing a lot of the power of the web as a result. Mm -hmm. And so the way I think about this is that, um, uh, you know, if you think about the web as a more curated web or a social web, um, if, if, if the browser didn't exist and you wanted to build a totally new browser from scratch, what would you build? Uh, and so for us, um, the, the very nature of doing anything with web content now has to be social. It has to be curated. And, um, and so that's very much a part of us. Now, we initially got started with Facebook and Twitter as sort of mm -hmm. the primary um, sort of source of content for mm -hmm. Flipboard. And it used to be that literally everything you saw on Flipboard was a tweet. And that was really cool. Um, but, you know, over time, um, what's happened is that we've started to develop our own community of people who are curating content, and we can get more and more signal from those people. And uh, Twitter still plays a very significant role on Flipboard, and I'm very thankful for that, because I think I'm a huge user and fan of Twitter. Um, uh, but uh, but, but the, the sort of the emphasis where, you know, uh, the social networks were sort of primarily powering everything that was happening on Flipboard, that has, has um, changed, you know, 180 degrees. And you were on the board of Twitter for a while. I was, yeah, um, which I enjoyed a lot. What was it like having a, having a front row seat there? It was awesome. Ooh. I mean, Twitter is, Twitter is a, you know, it's a, a, one of those companies that can genuinely say they're changing the world. 
and uh, it's, it is an amazing thing to be a part of that. Um, you know, Twitter is uh, um, growing super fast. Uh, they are um, doing really big, meaningful things, and you know, to be you know involved in that and have some influence on that was was awesome. And there were lots of reports that there, there was some tension because of the direction Twitter was going and the direction Flipboard was going. That they were you were there was maybe, some of maybe that. heading for a collision course, right? Um, did that play a role in you leaving the board? Well, you know, I felt that um, ultimately it wouldn't be good for me to stay on the board um, where it felt like Flipboard was either going to be competitor or partner of Twitter. And I knew that there was a critical moment coming up where I would have to negotiate that with Twitter. Yeah. And so that we would end up being partner, you know, friend, not foe. And, um, and there was no way that I felt comfortable doing that mm. on the board. So I talked to Jack and Dick, and after you know, a few months, um, decided that the you know, best thing to do would be for me to step down and then work on a partnership with Twitter, which we did. Mm. And we have a great partnership with them, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, which I'm you know, very, very uh, happy about. So, but that was a key reason why, uh, it, it, uh, why I left the board. And I, I was kind of sad to do it. But, at the same time, also building your own company, it's awfully hard to take time to go and work on another company too. So as Flipboard continued to grow, it was a bit of a relief to be able to just kind of focus on, on Flipboard. And, um, and so you actually, you, you do have this partnership with Twitter, even though they've, they've said that they, you know, when they talk about how people partner with them, use their API to, to connect to their data, they don't want you to kind of create a reading experience for tweets. Um, yet you've been able to kind of work out a relationship. How did you, how did you do that? What we that think of Twitter um, and Facebook and others as publishers. Mm -hmm. They have to have um, a reason for being on Flipboard. It's a privilege, not a right, mm -hmm. for us to have Twitter on Flipboard. Um, and I've never forgotten that. And that's the case with all of our publishers. Um, so we have to create a reason for them to want to be there. So what we do, for example, is if somebody takes a tweet and puts it into a magazine, it better stay as a tweet. You mm -hmm. have to retweet. You have to have a favorite button. It doesn't get converted into something that isn't a tweet. Like if you mm -hmm. pin a tweet, guess what? It's no longer a, a tweet anymore on Pinterest. It's, it's oh, a pin. That's a good point. Right? So um, very, very important for us to you know, respect that, uh, both with Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. So we want to drive engagement and discovery for Twitter and for Facebook, just like we do for our publishers. So, so because we've had that approach and we've been so hardcore about it, I think that earned Twitter's respect and you know, we, uh, we were able to work out a, a, a partnership that we've been able to uh, um, you know, work together. Um, and we'll continue to hopefully expand on that. Was it also a factor that you had Facebook on the one hand and Twitter on the other? And neither may have wanted to kind of give up the turf, give up this turf called Flipboard to their to their arch rival. Well, there are a lot of uh, users of who who like to look at Twitter and Facebook content on Flipboard, and so um, to do right by those users, you know, nobody wants to just sort of you know change that. Uh, yank the, yank so, the rug out from. Yeah, there. exactly. So um, so I think you know. Um, that's all gone pretty well. But you know, at the same time, I, I also always recognize that these are not, um, uh, these are things that could change. And so for us, uh, it's also really important uh, for it, us to be sure that we have our own community of users who are curating content and creating signal on Flipboard um, uh, uh, so that we can also be, uh, you know, stand on our own two feet. One of the first conversations we had when uh after I came to read write was um, was about your return to the web yeah you you launched on mobile but um, you are you know as, as you said you first thought of flipboard um, as, as a website and, right you know that's what you were writing right. it for right and those are your roots actually you um, you worked for a long time at uh, at Netscape the original web browser company you came to them through an acquisition though Yes. Uh, of a company called Paper Software. Mm -hmm. What was Paper doing? 
paper was about making computers as simple and as practical as a piece of paper. We envisioned that computers of the future would just be memory with a screen. And um, we were 15 years ahead of our time. <laughs> so we started out being like a company um, that was focused on pen computing. Mm -hmm. um, I was a proud developer of Go, on pen point, uh, you know, pen point uh, and uh, general magic and, uh, and so on. Um, and, uh, but um, ultimately, we ended up uh, building a user interface uh, a, 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 for, which ultimately became the foundation for uh, NCS, uh, for Mosaic from mm -hmm. Quarterdeck Office Systems. So we ended up being a, um, uh, a, a UI toolkit, effectively, um, for rendering content, displaying content on the web. Mm -hmm. And we also uh, focused on how that could also happen, not just in 2D, but in 3D. So we mm -hmm. built a world's first 3D plugin. We actually built the first plugin ever for Netscape. Um, before they even had a plugin API, we hacked the Netscape browser and built a plugin that could let you browse the web in 3D using a technology called VRML, which oh, was an open that, standard for that, virtual reality. That takes me way back. I know. So Don't get me started about big book. Ex but. Exactly, big book. So we, um, uh, we wanted to you know, create something that was this you know, really awesome experience for content, um, but ended, ended up uh, you know, uh, uh, getting acquired by Netscape and uh, Incredibly excited about that. I moved from Woodstock, New York to California. Got a chance to work with Mark Andreessen. Uh, I worked for Mark. Uh, got to know John Doerr and Jim Barksdale and Jim Clark. And John all Doerr these other great of people. Perkins John is now Doerr. on your board. Exactly. Yeah. So that was my entry into Silicon Valley. And, and you know, paper was a six-year odyssey for me in building it. I was, it was my first startup. And so I, you know, I had no idea how to start a company. I went out and bought all the books like... Uh, 101 winning business plans and, you know, 15 ways to raise capital and all that kind of stuff. Did, did one of them work? Uh, eventually. Yeah. You know, it took me a while. I only raised $100,000 in the six years that I was building paper. Wow. Yeah. How and, much have you raised at, at Flipboard? Uh, $160 million. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Big difference. <laughs> that should, yeah, that, that, should, that should take care of you for, for a little while. Exactly. Um, the, the real estate is very expensive in the Bay Area. So yes, it is. It about. is. So Absolutely. You may have to plunk some of that on. on well, yeah, I raised, I, you know, I, a lot of people ask why did we raise that much money. And uh, I wanted to buy us runway mm -hmm. um, so that we didn't have to be forced into making unnatural decisions around the product or the monetization, the business model, our partnering. We want to make sure we have plenty of runway to do the right thing because this is. It's a big industry that's being disrupted now, a huge amount of change, and uh, we need all the runway we can get so that you know, we're not being forced into decisions just because we need to, to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. um, I want to go back to, to Netscape. Uh, when you were there, you actually worked on a, a product that was a little bit like Flipboard. It was about distributing content on the web. Yes. Um, what was it called? It was called Netscape Netcaster. Uh, and this was back in the days of Pointcast. Who, who here remembers Pointcast? Yeah, um, very cool product. Um, and uh, Pointcast was, you know, Pointcast, Netcaster, that stuff, in some ways, the forerunner to what we were doing with Flipboard. You know, I, I've always wanted to make it really easy for people to access content and to publish content and to benefit from great content. So paper software was about, you know, having a tablet computer where you could just navigate you know, really awesome content. Discover it, publish it, monetize it. And that vision to prove to be way, 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 way too ahead of its time. Um, there was no, there was not even wireless. There wasn't even a web then. There were, and there were no tablet computers that were worth their weight. So um, the other thing, though, uh, at Netscape was I figured, okay, well, now we have this web. Now we can actually start to make this, this happen, democratize, you know, publishing. Um, and to a certain extent, that started to happen. And Netcaster was, a, was meant as a way to start to embrace that. Um, but it was also a little too ahead of its time. Uh, it was, we wrote the whole thing in HTML. In fact, it was one of the projects that helped inspire the event model uh, that we now know of as dynamic HTML or HTML. Uh, um, you know, HTML5. It, yeah, exactly, yeah. HTML5. And, and, um, and so you know, we, we helped get the... The, the event model going. So it wasn't just a document markup language. Um, mm -hmm. 
it was, it was a way to actually create an app. Mm -hmm. And so we wrote Netcaster in HTML. It was, but in it some proved, sense, it was the first web app. Yeah, it was an actual, yeah, exactly. It was, a, it was an app that was meant as a service that was written in HTML. It would be fired up by native code, you know, and pull out as like a sidebar. Um, the problem was it worked great while we were building it, but then the security guys put in all these like crazy security restrictions. And you had to like authorize the app to like have access to your hard drive and all this stuff. And, and all of those security dialogues were written in Java. And to fire up the Java runtime took literally a minute and a half. And so like to even just get Netcaster running, like it was like a minute and a half of spinning on your computer before anything even launched. It was, it was horrible. Uh, so it's, it was just, we, we really died by the cutting edge there uh, yeah. of, of technology. It, it's almost like a metaphor for your, you know, for your early career. You were, you had the ideas, you had things you wanted to create, but you were just held back, spitting, yeah. you know, by the technology, by yeah. the state of the art. Absolutely. And um, yeah, people who know me, uh, you know, they, they often refer to Flipboard as my, my third or fourth browser company. Um, in some ways, that's, you know, that's, that's kind of true. I mean, I've always been about trying to enable great content to you know, get to the masses and, and have it look beautiful and incredibly easy to use, ideally through some sort of you know, touch tablet-like device. Um, so yeah, that's the mission I've been on pretty much for my whole career. And now we're at the right time with the right technology to make some real changes. Exactly. Exactly. Um, well, that's great. I want to make sure we have time for audience questions. We're taking questions um, from the audience here, also on Twitter, um, via the Read, Write, Mix hashtag. Um, so if you're, if you're in the room but you're shy, you can also tweet your question that way. Um, Alyssa has, uh, has a microphone. Um, does anyone have a question to start us off? We have one there. How do you handle um, censorship? Some content is perhaps not worth democratizing. How do you tackle that? Um, you mean in respect to things like China or? Or, the, uh, you know, content that's really everyone would probably quantify as, yeah. as, as offensive. Yeah. Well, that's a very tricky problem, and it's an industry-wide issue. and. Uh, there have been some good um, steps forward in this world where uh, you know, Google and Microsoft and uh, Yahoo and others have banded together to seek out that content and, and eliminate it. Um, uh, so uh, we're participating in those kinds of uh, industry-wide things. And we are also trying to innovate on that front too. There are certain patterns that you can start to detect around that that, that could allow us to flag that kind of content. And then, of course, users can, you know, report that kind of stuff and, and so on. So, uh, but this is definitely, you know, anytime you get into a situation where people are able to create packages of content, you're going to run into those sorts of issues. Um, we have a very um, uh, sort of zero tolerance policy for content that violates our user guidelines. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we, we have a whole team that, you know, reaches out to people where they're violating those. And if they continue to violate, we kick them off. So, uh, um, but that's, that's definitely a challenge uh, that every, every content company has to worry about. I don't think we have any, necessarily any magical answers beyond what a lot of the other folks are doing right now. It's, it's really, a, a, I think, a way and a very important thing for all companies to work together to solve this problem. Good. Um, I think we've got a question from, from Twitter. How do, you, how do you achieve content that people say they're interested in? and deliver serendipity. So, you know, if you're, the serendipity yeah, content is right. what you're you, not looking for. Right. You don't know right. that you wanted it. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is actually something that Zeit is quite good at. You know, you can say you're interested in certain interests, but yet they can still surface stuff that you might not, didn't even know you were interested in, and now, uh, you, you know, you discover that you are. Uh, so you have to have that element of serendipity. And there are a variety of ways to achieve that. One is, you know, um, through um, algorithms that uh, do, you know, effectively collaborative filtering to say, okay, well, people who like these topics also tend to like some of these things. So let's mm -hmm. every now and then throw some of those things in. Another way to do it is with community. You know, people, you know, can 
can post content. People are unpredictable creatures. They're not, they're not algorithms. So they will inject a certain amount of serendipity right out of the gate if you have a sense of community. Mm -hmm. So um, those are just two examples. Um, but those are definitely, that is something that we, we do spend quite a time, a bit of time thinking about. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, yes, back there. Hi there, I'm a huge fan. I have my own magazine called Media and Tech, if anyone is interested in subscribing. Awesome. Um, and I work with publishers on a daily basis. So um, I think there's a disconnect with advertisers between print and digital. So they're still willing to advertise very much in the print space. Yeah. And they don't recognize the value of digital magazines and um, digital publishing. And recently a study came out that showed that print ads and digital ads has the same recall on tablet devices. So what can we do to convince advertisers that there is as much value in digital versus print? Yeah, that is um, an excellent question. And it, there, it's a multifaceted set of things that have to be done there. The net of it is um, you have to put your, your, you know, you have to put your, you know, advertiser hat on. You know, what is an advertiser trying to do? If you're a banana republic, you know, you don't want to just, you, you basically need to get people to decide that they should wear khakis, right? And before you can even sell them khakis. Uh, and um, how do you do that? Um, you, you're not going to do that with a keyword ad. You're not going to do that with a banner ad. You're going to do that with a full page ad in a magazine or a beautiful outdoor ad on a billboard or a TV ad. Um, you have to create the desire, you have to create the sense of passion or enthusiasm around some you know, trend, right? Uh, like wearing khakis instead of jeans. Once you've created that, then you can harvest that demand. Hey, we, you know, we hear some khakis for $25 or whatever it is. So, so you have to kind of look at the whole picture. You know, what does it create, what does it take to create demand and awareness of a brand? And then how do you harvest that demand? And create a, a mechanism that can sort of contemplate all of that and not just one part of it. Um, and then you need to figure out ways to quantify how you're doing in those different areas. And there are different ways to do it. There's quantification that can be done on offline that you can repurpose for online. So for example, you know, we've run Nielsen studies uh, that show that Flipboard ads are actually better at recall than TV ads, um, than TV. Um, so uh, uh, there, we can show those to advertisers and, um, you know, uh, we want to try to do an even better job at making more of that content, more of that, uh, those insights public so people can start to see more of that. Um, and also transparent reporting. You know, uh, you know, what are the signals, what are the cues that cause, you know, that, that are leading indicators that show that a brand is, is making progress in their messaging? Um, you know, how do we get that across? There are huge amounts of heuristics that, that can be, you know, um, transparently shared with, with marketers in ways that don't violate privacy that I think could be helpful there. So, but it's a, it's a major challenge and it's, it's really a, a lot of work to, to get that to happen. But I think, I think it can and, and uh, uh, it's, it, we're already seeing a lot of success as is evidenced by the kinds of advertisers that we have. Whether it's, uh, you know, um, uh, Gucci and Breitling, the really beautiful advertisers, or it's the, the ones who have invested heavily in content marketing like uh, Merrill Lynch or Morgan Stanley, or um, whether it's, it's the folks who've created catalogs like uh, Van Cleef and Arpels or Levi's where they have catalogs on Flipboard or Banana Republic. Um, uh, so we're seeing these really high-end brands that don't normally do a lot of digital advertising uh, actually coming to Flipboard and, and doing that. Uh, and that's, that's, you know, I think hopefully we can help uh, get that, you know, have be an example of how that is working. A uh, question from Twitter. Yeah. Um, Casey Thomas wants to know, what are you doing to engage more with the developer community to ensure you're in the middle of media value creation? We have done very little with the developer community so far. Um, we don't have an API, um, and that is something that um, we really do believe uh, uh, will change. Um, it's just a matter of uh, when um, and, and, and exactly what. But you know, things that we've thought about there are the ability for developers to put content into Flipboard, mm -hmm. uh, for them to be able to get content out of Flipboard uh, in structured ways that makes sense for the publisher. Um, uh, for developers to be able to 
control how content can be rendered uh, or to create new kinds of content that could be then curated in Flipboard uh, or to tap into the curation layer on Flipboard. So these are all possible areas for APIs. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and we've been thinking about those and trying to figure out what should we do first and, and how and how do we make that work. But, but it's, it's only a matter of time before we, we start doing those kinds of things. So nothing, nothing, nothing that a developer can play with future. today? Not yet. Not yet. Are you, do you have like a, a page developers can sign up on if they're, if they're interested? I, I think Pinterest had yeah. like this, you know, had uh, this page, like a wait list for the API. Right, right. We don't have that time. yet because we wanted to be a little bit more concrete about what we were planning before we did something like that. But, um, but it is something that uh, I think this is a good point. And probably should try to, you know, at some point soon, be a little bit more clear about that. You know, maybe so, next year sometime. So clearly some, some interest from, from yeah. developers yeah. in playing with Flipboard. Uh, another question from the audience? Um, I see back there. Content for companies that, for media tech companies like uh, Flipboard, and watching like what BuzzFeed is doing, and maybe like Pop Sugar, and even the more extreme what Netflix has done with original programming, mm -hmm. is that? And you dip your toes in by having editors. Is this something that you know right. curators want to get into? We we don't believe um, that we should be creating content ourselves. We don't believe we should create content ourselves. It's it's we want to enable great content to be created by other people. Um, so. Uh, that's a pretty clear line with us, um, and not one that we want to cross over. Um, uh, you know, we will definitely create, continue to create tools that allow uh, a meritocracy to get, you know, to happen. So, whether you're an individual who wants to create content on Flipboard or you're a giant publisher uh, and everyone in between, we'd like to be sure that we can be a good platform for folks uh, who want to do that. But we don't want to compete with the people who are building on our platform. Uh, uh, that, I think, would be a bad idea. Let's see. Uh, we'll take one more question from Twitter, then one, uh, one more question from the audience. Um, Jane Yeo asks, what's Flipboard's business model? Is it all advertising, or do you have other, other revenues? Yeah, you know, and this is a good question, because um, it's always so interesting how sometimes entrepreneurs um, think it's like really great if they have like multiple ways they can make money. Oh, we can make money all these different ways, A and B and C and D. It turns out that to get any one of those ways to make money to work is incredibly hard. So, um, so we early on said, look, we have one business model, it's advertising, and that's what we're going to focus on. So um, uh, you know, that, is, that's, that is now and probably always will be our, our, our primary focus. And, uh, and, and that is hard enough as it is, just to get advertising working. Um, and uh, even though we could probably make money with commercial transactions, people, we have catalogs mm -hmm. on Flipboard. We don't take a percentage of those transactions, mostly because we think it's just better that people come to Flipboard to go and find that, those products. And mm -hmm. we don't want to add, be another point of friction in the sale you know, uh, between the customer and the, and the, um, the, the, the seller. So you know, we think you know, we'd rather have the seller by advertising on Flipboard, uh, for example. So, so create, create a, a magazine yeah. catalog and, right. then, and then pay to distribute right. that. Exactly, which Banana Republic and Levi's and Van Cleef and Arpels, they do that right now. They, they, we make money from them through the advertising that they buy. Mm -hmm. um, they build a presence on Flipboard, you know, a catalog on Flipboard. Then they promote that catalog on Twitter and Facebook and they even advertise it in outdoor billboards mm -hmm. and things like that and get people to come to it, but they also buy ads on Flipboard to get people to come to, to their catalogs as well. So you're not taking a cut when the transaction yeah. happens. Okay. Um, well, let's take one last question from the audience. I think uh, I see someone back there. Does Flipboard uh, currently or do you intend to limit the size of the personal magazines? The size of personal magazines? Yeah, for the amount of content that you can add. No. Um, in fact, just the opposite. We want personal magazines to be as big and as rich and as structured or unstructured as those magazine makers want them to be. 
Um, and uh, you know, I'm I'm incredibly excited. In fact, I've I I don't think I've ever been as excited as I am about any set of products I've ever worked on, uh, as the ones that we're about to do toward the end of this year. Um, there's awesome stuff that we want to do for people who are making magazines, um, for people to discover that curation, um, and uh, for people to really you know take content and content um, packaging and narrative to a whole new level. And so you know we're going to do some great stuff that'll kind of take us on a whole new phase of our journey uh, and well into next year, uh, you know, uh, toward the end of this year, which I'm, I'm incredibly excited about. Well, I guess we'll have to wait and see what, uh, what those are. Um, very interesting start to the, um, to the small publisher program, starting to share the wealth. With, yeah, uh, I'm excited about that. With uh, yeah. some of your magazine. By the way, one, one thing also I wanted to mention um, is that we will be rolling out um, video ads uh, in September. Oh, well. Because uh, uh, historically, you think of Flipboard as an article experience, or that, a yeah. reading experience. It, there's actually quite a bit of video already on Flipboard. Um, and we'll do even, you'll see us do even more with video in you know, next year and things mm -hmm. like that. But, but one of the things we want to do is enable video ads. Um, and uh, so you'll be able to have. Um, uh, videos on Flipboard, uh, video ads on Flipboard uh, in September. One of the first advertisers will be Chanel. Um, oh. You know, again, one of those great advertisers that you don't often run into, you know, on the web. No. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited about that. Yet, yet you classically see in print magazines. Exactly. Exactly. So th that's really interesting because you'd never see, you know, a Chanel video is an entirely new ex kind of experience. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, Somewhere, somewhere between print and TV, and yet of, mm -hmm. of neither medium. Right. Yeah, the world of TV, the world of print, um, these worlds are actually merging, you know. Uh, there's, we're moving to this, you know, more atomized, but then reconstructed world where, you know, content can be atomized and then reconstructed around an interest or a topic that somebody's really passionate about. And that can be video, it can be an article, it can be a photo, it can be music, it can be audio, podcasts, anything. And, you know, that is, um, you know, that's that, that power of both algorithmic and, you know, you know people curating mm -hmm. content, collecting that content, packaging it up together in some kind of narrative around that topic. You know, that's a huge opportunity and that's, that's what we're all about. We talk about the web as like, you know, as its own medium, but it's really a medium of media. It's, you know, yeah. it kind of, it can contain all of the things we're doing today. Exactly. In other means. That's right. That's, this is that more social web, right? It's it's not just people, it's not documents pointing to documents or people pointing to documents or pages. Now it's pieces of content, right? It's it's videos, it's songs, it's it's um, you know, podcasts or images or segments of content or you know, little mini apps or widgets, you know, all these things are part of this web now. And it's a very exciting time. So that is the future of media, an, an atomized web of pieces of content chosen by people like you and me. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mike McHugh. Thank you. And, uh, thank you. and thanks again to all of you for supporting Girls Who Code and for attending Read, Write, Mix. Um, stay tuned for future events. You can find those on readwrite.com. Um, Please stay for, uh, for one more drink and some more conversation. Thank you all. Thank you.